Welcome. I'm glad you're here on this uh, Labor Day weekend. Uh, I know that a lot of times we have a few numbers on Labor Day, but we're glad you're here this morning to celebrate worship with us. Let's, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. <clears throat> Gracious God, even now, despite all interpretations and study, We do things just like the disciples and the crowds did. We get ready to follow with enthusiasm. We're excited and we're just all about 
following you, and then we realize the, the, the truth that our energy runs out, our money runs out, and I, we get discouraged, and we kind of fall to the wayside. But Lord, may your spirit regenerate us to a new vitality. Make us be living stories of Jesus Christ. And Lord, help us to proclaim the good news and be the disciples that you are calling us to be. In Christ's name, amen. Good morning. Our opening hymn is 139. We are singing verses 1, 3, and 5 because Catherine Winkworth, British scholar and musician, translated this from the German 200 years ago. We appreciate Catherine doing that and hundreds of other hymns. So we're honoring Catherine Winkworth this morning by singing verses 1, 3, and 5 of 139. Please stand. standing for our affirmation of faith found on page 881 the Apostles Creed I believe in God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth and in Jesus Christ his only Son our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified dead and buried the third day he rose from the dead 
He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. be seated. You accept this invitation. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin, and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. And that confession will be found in your, in your hymnal on page 12. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. May we confess in silence. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Now is the time in our service where we give uh, God's tithes and our offerings as the ushers come forth.
we stand, please? and gracious God, through your Son, you have called us to follow. These gifts we offer today are a small token of the affirmation that we accept your call. Help us to embrace the full meaning of that call and to be faithful to it. By your grace and with the help of Jesus, we pray. Amen. reading this morning from the Gospel according to Luke. Great multitudes accompanied Jesus, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going to encounter another king in war, 
will not sit down first and take counsel whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends an embassy and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, whoever of you does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is neither fit for the land nor for the dunghill. Men throw it away. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Thank you, Joel. You do such a beautiful job reading. Appreciate you. Let's pray together. Gracious and holy God, we pray that you would open our ears to hear. Help us to be the salt of the earth and not lose our taste, not lose the taste of the salt. Lord, because when we lose it, we're not even fit for dirt and the dunghill. Lord, open our hearts to hear what discipleship really means in our lives. In Christ's name, amen. Today's lesson is a continuation of last, the last week's chapter about Jesus teaching around the table in the home of a, an important leader in the church, a Pharisee. Oh, but now he has turned and he begins to teach in the crowds and, and he's traveling and they're following on this journey. And he's teaching and, you know, I, I, just, I read over this and Joel said he read over it and, and you think, really, Jesus? Really? Is this literally, really what discipleship is? This is tough stuff he's saying here, isn't it? Hate? Really? And he turns and he begins to teach and, and people are following him everywhere and he's going from Galilee. To, he's left Galilee and he's going to Jerusalem and he's, and he's, he's left the peasant area and he's, he's going to face the powers that be. I remember when we transitioned that. Chris uh, Brown, who was our leader in Israel, said, now we're getting ready to take a whole different journey when we leave Galilee and go to Jerusalem. It's a big city. It's, it's hectic. It's traffic coming all over the place. You gotta, and he said, you've got to watch out and not get lost and not get separated. And just the heat and the, uh, you, know, you know how it is in the big city. It's, it's just hustle bustle. So it's a whole different world that Jesus is entering into and he's ha he has all these crowds that are following him. And he's asking them, do you really, really know what you're doing when you follow me? Do you really know what that means? He's being honest. He's telling them the truth. He's not going to give them any, any feel-good things here. He's, he's giving them the truth. He's telling them to count the cost. Because there is cost in following Jesus. Perhaps we've been fooled in our age of paid staff that being a disciple is coming to a church one or two hours on Sunday morning. Not sharing the gospel. That's the staff's job. Not inviting others to church. That's the staff's job. Serving only when we don't have any other family obligations. We've got some who are serving and serving and serving and they're just exhausted. And then we've got others that need, need to be committed. But Jesus is telling us to be committed. To share the gospel and to... to, to to work hard and to, to be committed to all that we do. You know, church membership is declining. It's been doing that for a few years now. The budget's declining. It's been doing that for a few years now. We've turned inward. It's kind of all about us. We, we want our needs met. We want things to be the way we want them to be. We want to be comfortable and we don't want to change and we don't 
don't want to do anything differently. We want to carry on with church as it always has been. But Jesus is telling us the truth about discipleship. It's not about us. And He's given us a practical solution to get outside of ourselves and think about Jesus and think about God and think about others and think about serving. And the older we get, the more we have to work at serving as a church. Because if we don't, we're going to die. That's just the reality of a small church, isn't it? And we're not, any, we're not any different than any other small church. It's just the reality of a small church. But we live in a commercial world that is very market-driven. And from every side as a leader, from every direction... We have books that we have, to, that we have to read. We have, we have continuing education credits we have to do. We have, we have people in our churches that give us advice. And that, it's all good because we need all that. But it's the same thing. Everybody's trying to give you a way to sell Christianity in a competing market of ideas. But Jesus didn't tell us to sell Christianity. He's telling us to be disciples of Jesus Christ. The Christian faith is not something we sell at a low cost or a low, it's not a low risk endeavor. It's a serious commitment. I think about Greg last week, Greg, Cindy's, Cindy's husband, Greg, Cindy Hatcher's husband, Greg. He was telling me about he was going on this 100 mile marathon on his bike. Now, what does it take to do something like that? You have to train. You have to have the right equipment. You can't just decide one day you're going to go out and do this 100-mile marathon and then, then just do it. You have to have the passion to do that. You have to really want to do that. And then there's all kinds of dangers along the way. There's all kinds of obstacles to overcome. And I even asked the question, how do, you, how, do you, how do you use the bathroom in that? Because he was trying to beat his time from last year to this year. Where do you even go to the restroom? Do you get to stop or what? I mean, I just thought about all those complicated things that would happen if you had to do that 100-mile trip. It was real. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer called the way we live sometimes is cheap grace. Bonhoeffer says, grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ, living in incarnate is cheap grace. We want to come and be spoon-fed like babies and go home and forget it. And when a church, we're a system, churches are a systematic group just like any other systematic operation institution. And we get into this little thing where we think that we're, we, we just want to do it a certain way and that's it. And we forget that, that the kind of disciples that we really want to make is the ones we really, we really become. Most of the time, that's non-committed, non-committal. We don't want to commit. That's too much trouble. We've got family. We've got lives. We've got things to do. We've got jobs. We've got careers. We've got, we've got all kinds of commitments. But Jesus is ta talking about discipleship. This is not me talking here. This is Jesus. Discipleship for Jesus is absolute allegiance. He has large crowds following him. Now, he could have let that go to his head, having all those people following. He's got a, by this time, he's got a huge following. 
But he's not thinking in that direction. He's thinking about, he's thinking about these crowds. He's telling them the truth about what they're doing. He's trying to get them to see the commitment that they need to make. You know how it is when you first, you first make a profession of faith. You're all excited. You're just, you're just so excited about it. And you want to take off on a 50-yard dash. But it's a marathon, guys. <laughs> and you have to play with others. You have to hand that baton to somebody else. It's not all about you. And you have to hand it in a way that they can receive it. But Jesus is saying, and I, and I read, read this, and I'm thinking, really, Jesus, do you really mean this? He's telling us the truth. And he says, I've lost my place. <laughs> um, he says, whoever comes to me and does not hate, that's a strong word, isn't it? does not hate father, mother, wife, children, brother, sister, and yes, even life itself cannot be my disciple. Does Jesus want us to hate? Of course not. But there is sacrifices. I know as a pastor, there's been so many sacrifices I've had to make. And sometimes my family's been really angry at me. Our youngest daughter, Jenny, is just, she's just, she just thinks I'm the most horrible thing in the world because I, I do all, I don't take the time to go visit as often as she likes. But if you're a church worker, I, I've heard Warren talk about this, you don't, you don't have a long weekend on Labor Day. You come to church. It's a sacrifice. You take vacations, but you don't have those long weekends that everybody else does. These are, a lot, these are commitments that you make as a pastor, and it's a good commitment. It's not a bad commitment. But your family's not always happy about it. I know there's times that Alan's made sacrifices that, that I just can't believe he's made those sacrifices so that I can be a minister. He gave up his job. He gave up a home that we built together and designed together. He had to pay for my college with two other kids in college. That was a sacrifice. But what Jesus is saying here, he's not telling us to actually hate our family. But he's telling us that, our, that God comes first even before our closest relationships. And he's using what is called a somatic hyperbole. He's using an exaggeration to get our attention to get us to listen. Because sometimes we just don't listen, do we? We don't want to hear the truth about what it means to commit to discipleship. But he's telling us to neglect our family to care for God and others. Forsaking our own life and, it's, and, and not being selfish about our lives. But to be able to surrender fully to the gospel. And there's no higher duty in this world than our commitment to God. Give it up. Give up our self-interest. Give up our competing loyalties. And commit ourselves to God. And then he tells the crowds, whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be in my disciple. To follow Jesus is to be willing to suffer. To be willing to pick those thorns occasionally and get stuck. Serve God above all to bear the cross. And then he adds, For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete it? 
Otherwise, he'd just lay the foundation and not be able to finish. And, and all, that, all that he had begun to do, people would really kill him for not finishing the job. Again, we start out eager. We start out enthusiastic. And when the money drops, when the attendance drops, when the, when the energy drops, we lose stamina. We forget what God has called us to do. Dreams soar, but if energy and resources fall short, the whole thing falls apart sometimes. And then Jesus said, adds, Oh, what king going out to wage war against another king will not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000. Now in life, in ministry, there's always going to be battles to fight. And they're not always pretty. There's evil out there. And we have to fight. And we have to consider what it takes to fight those battles. And it takes sacrifice. It takes commitment. Discipleship is costly, folks. Jesus is saying that. Don't take it lightly. There are times that we're going to be outnumbered. There's the times that we're going to have to negotiate. There's times that we're going to just feel like it's overwhelming. But we have to keep marching forward. We need commitment. We need, we, we, we need to know that we're making a covenant with God and that God keeps God's promises. It's long-term. It takes perseverance. And Jesus is not teaching the crowds doctrine. He's teaching them how to be disciples. Simple. Leave it all behind and follow me. All is the big A, the big L, the big L. Leave it all behind. Again, he says, so therefore, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. The price to follow Jesus is full surrender. Every time you make a commitment to serve on a committee of this church, you're making a commitment to discipleship. You know, what happens in our world is gradually, slowly, gradually, slowly, we get comfortable and we feel like we don't really need to make a commitment. Somebody else can do that. But Jesus is not saying that, is he? He's saying, if you want to be a follower of me, if you want to be a disciple, it's going to cost you something. And you have to give up your own personal issues. And that's hard. Because i got lots of issues. I don't know about you. <laughs> given our time, given our energy. There's lots of currency in, in discipleship. Time, energy, change in personal relationships, putting God first. Sometimes we have to change our vocation. Sometimes we have to dedicate ourselves wholly to God. Sometimes we have to give up our financial resources. Think about how much money we just waste that we could give to God. I mean, we have rummage sale every year, and we just keep growing the stuff. And do we really need all that stuff? Or could we be more productive if we dedicated our tithe to God? Or God's tithe to God? Jesus says, therefore, none of you can become my disciple unless. Think about that. 
It's not easy. Jesus wants deep commitment, allegiance to Jesus over all competing, competing loyalties, family, self-interest, possessions. And he says, my dear friends, does it really matter? Sure, it does. Will anybody notice? Maybe the people around us don't always notice. But Jesus does. God does. God notices when we're committed. And that's the solution to growing a church. Discipleship, commitment, and following Jesus Christ with our whole hearts, with passion, with training, with perseverance, with love, with putting ourselves aside. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also be Lift up your hearts. Up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread. He gave thanks to God, and he broke the bread, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after the supper... He took the cup, he gave thanks to you and gave it to the disciples and said, drink from, from this. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine and make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen.
gracious and holy God, we thank you for this mystery. We thank you for the sacrifice. We thank you for your great love for us. We thank you for your passion. We thank you for teaching us how to be disciples in Christ's name. Amen. Our hymn of sending forth is the great Charles Wesley communion hymn 616. Come sinners to the gospel feast. We'll sing verses 1 and 5 of 616. Please stand. Receive this benediction. We go out as disciples of Jesus Christ, marked by his love, counting the cost. Are we fully committed to the cause? May the Spirit continue to stir your heart so that you may finish the, the journey as a true disciple. Go in peace. Amen.